Welcome to Polycast, a civilization podcast focused on game strategy. Dan Q. Makalua. The Me and Team. Mad Jin. What I'm going to do is I'm going to phone Mackie, and then she's going to see the number, and then she'll magically appear. Mm. Okay. Oh, wait, no, she magically appeared right now. <laughs> <laughs> Threatened to do it. Awesome. Yep. <laughs> you were about to get a phone call. Hello, listeners. Welcome to episode 179. I am the main team, and I have with me regular co-host, Stan Q. I'm one step ahead of strategy. Makalua. I'm still not awake. <laughs> and Majin. Uh, apparently, I drank all of Mackie's coffee. Yeah, give it back. <laughs> yeah, you don't really want it back now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I know, but you know what I mean. Uh, okay, I, I just... <laughs> Make no. another pot, whatever. <laughs> this is a strategy podcast. Really? But there hasn't been a lot of strategy discussion recently because so much was going to change because of... Wait a minute, uh, we're talking about Civilization Five. Was there an expansion pack that was just released? What was it called? One World? Hee <laughs> hee. Not eventually. I'm sorry, Brave New World. So what we're actually going to be doing over the next few episodes is talking about different aspects of Brave New World, and we're not going to tie it to any specific Civ community thread. I tried that, and it was extremely cumbersome. This episode, we're going to be looking at four of the new civilizations, as well as trade routes and wonders. Start with, Mac, you'll tell us what civilization. Any mini miny mo? <laughs> How about this just shown? Okay, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you. I, I don't. That's the civilization you we stole from Dan. <laughs> what? <laughs> I told you, I have a Portugal. <laughs> All right, so here's what we'll talk about. Somebody. I to keep the alphabetical order of the civs that we're going to be talking oh, about. In that case, they're... I'll take a nap while you talk about Morocco. <laughs> What that means is I will introduce our first civilization instead. You just wanted me to speak earlier. Appreciate that thoroughly, Mackie. It's very thoughtful <laughs> in your roundabout sort of way that you, you know, applied that. Is that a raspberry? I, I like raspberries. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that's what they call them. <laughs> First new civilization from Brave New World is Morocco, with their unique ability Gateway to Africa, receiving plus three gold and plus one culture from each international trade route with a different civ or city state. And the trade route owner receives plus two gold for each trade route sent to Morocco. The unique improvement is the Caspa, which is available at uh, Chivalry, so it's a medieval arriving unique improvement. It can only be built on a desert tile, provides one additional food, production, and gold. It also provides uh, the same plus 50% defense as a fort and, of course, must be built in Moroccan territory. I like that because it ties well into their unique unit, which is the cavalry replacement, uh, Berber cavalry, which gives this plus 50% uh, combat bonus in desert, plus also a combat bonus in home territory, uh, plus 25%. So uh, I think the Casbah kind of you know, speaks for itself. It. Uh, I hate using the word synergy, and I'm I'm going to use it because people know what it is that I'm talking about. You've got the unique ability. You've got the Caspa, which also has a gold connection, but it also has a defensive connection and a desert connection, which we find both of those things in the cavalry. And if you compare other units that are available in the industrial, besides the cavalry placement itself, you compare it with a rifleman, for example, or even the Swedish and the Norwegian replacements for the riflemen, uh, the Carolean and the ski infantry, respectively. This is a particularly powerful unit that also has that movement. So it can be defending barbarians. It can be defending off other civilizations that are trying to invade your territory by moving in, attack, and withdrawing can help protect your Kasbahs from being pillaged. And these units can also be used to protect 
your trade routes as well. If you're going to construct a trade route, you want to ensure that it is being protected. And you probably want that protection in place before you establish the trade route, more or less at the same time. So from beginning to end, this civilization seems to have a lot going for it and all it's connected which I think makes it one of the nine civilizations that we're going to be talking about over the next few episodes, certainly in the top half, and I would argue in the top three in terms of general usability, general strength, general desirability. Yeah, Morocco, if you're in the middle of a desert, it's pretty solid. Petra plus Morocco plus Desert Faith, and yeah, uh-huh. see you later. <laughs> and then Kasbah is everywhere to defend yourself on all those crappy uh, tiles. And then, of course, on top of that, you have the nice uh, cav replacement is good. They're fairly useful. I just The one worry I have about Morocco itself is if you're not in a massive desert, <laughs> then, yeah, a lot of Morocco's stuff just is desert focused. If you don't have one, they're a lot less useful. <laughs> Even though I like to disable start bias. Um if you're really worried about that and i agree that that hurts but unless you set yourself like a a wet map type or something like that which which you can force i mean you can always get luck screwed on your start but it's kind of one of those things where it just kind of takes the icing away from the cake that is the moroccan unique uh, ability and improvement and units so it hurts but it doesn't cripple them but i agree without the desert it's a little less shiny yeah the trade routes, getting the culture in that, I mean, it's okay. You're not going to get like an insane amount of culture out of it unless you're playing on a huge map and have trade routes to everybody or they have trade routes into you. A little extra culture isn't bad, especially earlier in the game, because that'll get you your early social policies a little bit faster. Plus, it does mount up towards your cultural defense versus tourism. So it's not going to be a huge amount towards defending your tourism, so I wouldn't really consider it anything worthwhile for that. But getting a couple extra social policies here or there a little bit faster than you would normally is fairly useful. Clearly, the Moroccans rock. (laughs) Okay. Every single time we talk about Morocco, that reference has to be made. You know, we just well, it, they made just, it an just, achievement. <laughs> well, they did. <laughs> you know why they made it an achievement? Because they heard us talk about it on this show. Fact. <laughs> and remember, when you say fact at the end of a sentence on the internet, it's therefore true. It's always fact. The evidence is clear. This strategy is the superior. There's a few changes from the Portugal we know and love slash hated from so far. <laughs> First of all, we have a new leader head, and I'm going to miss Johnny, because, man, when you saw that face in music pop up, you always knew that there was going to be a city with 8.7 million cities or so somewhere. But no, now we have Mariah. No comment on that yet. Maybe uh, maybe she can replace the troll face that was her predecessor in Civ. The Fatoria lets you take a share of whatever resources your neighboring city-states are producing and uh, get double if they're allies. Unlike the previous game, that means you might actually use it sometimes. <laughs> that is a big improvement. You actually have a, a unique that you would consider using in any circumstance ever. It's really so, good when you slap them up in uh, mercantile city-states. That way you don't even have to bother uh, allying them to get their uh, special luxury for the extra happiness. Uh, Preferably not on the luxury, though. <laughs> Any gold you might have otherwise spent trying to ally yourself with that city-state, to tie just a little further to what Madrin was saying, you could spend on something else, like maybe rushing their unique unit if you so desired. Ah, uh, yes. Well, since it's being decided the order that I'm discussing these then, the next the unique unit is the now, I guess. Like, now. Uh, now. Now. It replaces now. the caravel. It's uh, strength 20, 5 movements. It excels at sea exploration because it's a caravel. It's so exciting. It has a one-time ability next to foreign lands to earn gold and experience. It's a decent amount the further away you go. If you're just taking it to your neighbor and just toss it off, then it's not actually going to get mm. uh, very much. I wouldn't rush by a now and go send it <laughs> off to get money from it. But <laughs> if you can hammer them out fairly quickly, like a couple turns each, then it's a decent source of income for a bit. I think it maxes out at about 600 gold, somewhere in there. But you have to be really far away. Huge maps will get you more gold than small maps. And then you can always just gift it to his near city-state and get some influence out of it. 120 hammer costs, you know, if you're actually getting that kind of gold, that's... Uh... Yeah, you can pay for your research agreements if you are willing to go for quite some distance. 
I, I like that Portugal has uniques now. <laughs> that are worth using. <laughs> yeah. Take your Great Lighthouse, you take your Exploration Opener. You can even put plus one movement on the now for promotions. And then you go zipping her across the uh, planet. We her. won't mind doing if you uh, are gifting them away. Well, that's the other thing. You're not going to keep a fleet of these things around afterwards. They are just <laughs> carabels. <laughs> Melee ships, go, go, go. Control the seas. <laughs> right up until a single frigate shows up. <laughs> and then you're done. <laughs> But yeah, while you're trying to find a safe as faraway destination as possible to use the golden experience ability for, if you got that extra movement and then you combine that with plus one sight, you can make that a very nice early exploratory unit. Mm -hmm. And then finally, we have a unique ability, the Mare Clausum. I guess that's how you pronounce it. I apologize to the listeners for butchering the pronunciations of these. Mare Clausum. Yeah, close enough. Resource diversity grants twice as much gold in international trader house. Solid. Yeah, it depends on how much diversity you have. If you're able to get that resource diversity, I mean, if you're going to get twice as much gold, that would work the same as having, potentially, if you could, have two trade routes coming from the same city to another city. Yeah. You can get one and a half trade routes if you're paying attention. It makes some of those early game trade routes worth a bit more, which can be obviously always key. Uh, The more you get earlier, the more you can do. So there is some benefit to it. But then again, the Fatoria saves you so much gold. <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> Portugal is definitely a trade slash get me gold sort of empire. And I'll take your stuff while I'm at it without paying for it. And the one thing about the Fatoria is slightly different. It counts as an act of war to remove it. So city states aren't going to remove it and no one else can actually pillage it, i.e. multiplayer game, without declaring war on you. Unless the multiplayer guys are just like, nope, no city states at all. And yeah. Kind of... of course, the Fatoria also has the little problem of sometimes on maps, all the city states basically get the same luxury, or two luxuries are floating around between all of the city states. Sometimes you're going to have maps where you just need one or two Fatoria to get all the city state based luxuries, except for the mercantile ones. So you might have to do three or four in total. Get super happy so you can grow super high, or go just conquer everybody. There are also those times you might find a map where there are no mercantile city-states, or at least none left that are still a city-state, having been taken over by somebody else. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Yoink! The Shoshone Pathfinders. Unique scout, which gets to pick what you get from the ruin. Now, you don't get to pick the same thing a bunch of times in a row. It seems like it resets after three or four ruins you go through, and then you, that can pop up again. But they're a little bit stronger, closer to a warrior strength. So if you run to a barbarian camp early, it's not so bad. It's not like turn around and run like it normally is with a scout. And also, they don't upgrade into archers if you get advanced equipment. They upgrade into composite bows. That's fun. Now you have a composite bow scout running around, and maybe it's only like turn 10, which is not good enough to threaten another civ with. Probably threaten a city-state with it, though. My shiny bow can be stuff. Dan will do that. <laughs> yeah, and that composite bow also keeps its, its Pathfinder promotion as well as, so... Yeah, it's still a scout, and it's still a bow. This is the only civilization that has a scout replacement unit, so there's another way that it's unique. Okay, that's why it's called a unique unit, but okay. (laughs) The thing is, there are unique units, like there are rifleman replacements from both. Yeah. It's a unique unique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dan just has a view of his words today. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, I I speak in words? What? Sometimes even in English. Anyway, the other unique unit are the Comanche Riders, which is basically a cavalry that's slightly cheaper to build and has a little bit faster movement. One an extra one extra move, which is nice if you're trying to run down somebody. But you also with it being cheaper, you could build up a few a lot faster, and then either upgrade them or just churn them out really fast. And then, hi, was that your civilization? Oops, I just rode right over it. Yeah, talked about with the Moroccan unique unit, the Berber cavalry. That it, it does a good job of cleaning up as well, and so does the Shoshone because in, in addition to it being faster as well as cheaper, good for those very quick attacks, and this ties into the unique ability that they receive a combat bonus when fighting in their own territory. You add kind of that element to there, and very good on defense. And when I say that, I mean an offensive defense, because, of course, it doesn't get any defensive terrain bonuses. But picking apart and then moving to safety, it's uh, quite a compliment. Yeah. I'm going to run down off this hill, kill your unit, run back up on the hill. Ha ha. 
Yeah, it's the get off my lawn uh, <laughs> plan. Large borders, defense in borders, and a oh, yeah. very and fast that, unit. The unique ability of the Great Expanse, that might be the slightly overpowered thing, because even your starting city, all of a sudden, bloop, you have a bunch of tiles as you wouldn't normally have. Every city you put down, bloop, bloop, literally blob up the map so fast, it's not even funny. Mm-hmm. And actually, for late game, raise and replace is actually a little better. Than, uh, <laughs> yeah, let me replace this with the city because for... I control all these tiles. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to my means, I burn down your stuff, and all of a sudden, boom, I got space. That's the thing that the ultimate get off of my lawn, Sue. So. Yeah, and then you're playing the game, and then they build the Great Wall. Oh. <laughs> and, uh. <laughs> That's the wall. strategy. <laughs> And when you start as a Shoshone, you start with the Pathfinder, mm-hmm. not a warrior. So you don't have to even worry about building your first scout. You already have it. An Uber scout. Yeah, it's just really expensive to build a second one. <laughs> it is more expensive, but I think the cost is worth it. I mean, of course, it depends on the size of map. If you know, for instance, hey, I'm playing on small island map, you're probably all right with just one. But if you feel the need that, hmm, I really should be scouting some more, building that second one, that to me, almost all of the time, it will pay for itself in terms of the added cost. Hmm. Uh, it just depends on how many are actually out there. I mean, there's some maps where, you're, you know, you're going to get two to four runes before you run into somebody else, and then that's it, because everybody actually expands in Explorers. Uh, and then you're going to get those other weird maps where you're off by yourself, and you have all this land, and you can basically just pick up like 10, 20 <laughs> runes before anybody gets around. So they, it is variable on that respect. I've had games where you get no runes uh, just because you're jammed in with somebody. It's also very helpful when you get the really annoying barbarians that decide to sit on runes. <laughs> yeah. Hey, guess what? My scout already is the base equivalent of a warrior. So you get off my ruin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you get off my ruins. So I can upgrade to a composite bow and shoot your friends. I know that the, the defense bonus in their own territory is really helpful because one of the last times we live streamed a turn cast and I played in the Immortal game with Petrox and Magin now, but I was able to hold off the Ottomans for a really long time being the Shoshone and having a defensible position in my territory and just like, nope, 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 stay off, nope. I mean, a really long time, like half the game. <laughs> I tried to start a war and it did not go well. <laughs> Kill them all, Matthew. <laughs> and then you find the Shoshone, and not only have they built the Great Wall, but they've also taken the Defender of the Faith, Enhancer Belief. Too bad I didn't have that. <laughs> and that also works for Morocco, actually, to tie in. Let's just start adding the percentage bonuses. Let's just have them build on top of each other. <laughs> it's like um, playing as Zerg or something. You have to expand your creep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oddly enough, on the map, they kind of have a grayish color, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can definitely go super massive expand with uh, Liberty and uh, Shoshone. Just, you know, spread your cities out, one city every six tiles or so, and your borders will fill it all in uh, and prevent anybody from wandering through there. So it's very, very simple to uh, walk up to another sieve and drop three settlers all at the same time and lock them out of a huge amount of territory. If you want to lock them out even more territory early on, not only could you play the Shoshone, you could also adopt tradition for the even greater border expansion. Yep, because that's the one thing about the border expansion is that uh, it doesn't increase the cost based on how many tiles you got. So the very first tile you take outside of your base uh, amount that you got given is still the same cost as everybody else's first tile. So you're always going to get to the fourth and fifth ring with your tiles. So tons and tons of land to lock down. So you don't need to settle nice and close to each other. So you can get all this land and then build all your shitties up nice and tall. How much fun is Venice? I gotta say, <laughs> one look at that sieve made me raise my eyebrows, but it also brought back some great memories of a really old PC game based on The Prince. <laughs> And you could do some rather questionable things uh, in terms of your moral makeup in that game. So that when Venice was included in Civ 5, it immediately reminded me of that. Like buying cardinals and bribing politicians to so that you become the elected official. Yeah, good stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's called bribing all the city-states. <laughs> yeah, it kind of works that way, doesn't it? The super to city, too. It just fits so well. It brings back good memories, and Venice itself is a good memory in Civ 5. Yay! 
How is Venice able to accomplish this magic? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, you may have to go to my YouTube channel and watch my LP. <laughs> <laughs> no, Venice is definitely the pro sieve or the hypercube, as uh, some random person randomly said. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Someone from this place called 2K. Yeah, I don't know. Venice being the pro sieve is just more the point of you need to know more of the mechanics to use them more effectively. Uh, You can't just play them like a normal sieve. And I see a lot of people complaining like that, like, oh, I can't do things with Venice, or this is a problem with Venice. Like, no, it's not a problem. Learn how to play Venice as Venice, and things will go better. Learn to play. But no, Venice has uh, all puppets, no annexing, no settling, with their uh, unique ability called Serenissima, uh, I think. You get a free Merchant of Venice at Optics, which is great because that's your unique great merchant variety that lets you just uh, wander over and steal city-states just like Austria, but you don't have to pay for it. You just get it. Just don't be at war at the same time. In respect to that, I know some people have complained that Venice is like crazier than Austria and needs to be nerfed for it. But the problem is Austria has to spend a lot of money to get up there and then spend to get up to allied state and then spend some money to buy them out. But Austria can actually do things with those cities and gold is easy to get. Great merchants, not as easy. Um, not to mention you have to give up your great scientists and engineers to get them. So in the end, Venice is very easily uh, limited on that respect. So other than the fact that you can steal city-states away from people, uh, you can always always just use your Merchants of Venice to get twice the amount of influence and gold of doing the ability for the merchants. And that is very, very useful. Lots of money, lots of influence, especially if you hit the same city-state over and over and over again. (laughs) You will have a super amount of influence with them and never need to spend money on them. just need to drop off your, you know, random Merchant of Venice every once in a while. Otherwise, Venice does have the ability to buy units and buildings and faith buy stuff in their puppets, which is different from everybody else. So that does make them pretty potent because you can have a nice big puppet empire where you just buy everything as you go. As well, double the amount of trade routes. So when it comes to money, you're not going to have any lack of it. With twice the amount of trade routes, you could easily just go mass trade routes out to everybody, take a huge gold per turn boost, and spend all that money in your puppets and have some very, very powerful cities to go along with your empire. Or you can just send all that trade routes back to your capital for uh, a super massive population capital very quickly. And of course, they also have the Great Gallius. It's a bit more powerful and a bit stronger than uh, the uh, Gallius it replaces. Aaron in the chat, Aaron90495, it said, and you answered this already in part, imagine. Do you guys think Venice needs a nerf? I haven't played against a human Venice player, but it seems like it'd get ridiculous and unstoppable by the mid-game. And I do think that a human player is going to be able to take greater advantage of this than the AI. Uh, assuming, as, as Imagine was saying, that you recognize from the outset that you can't play the civilization the same way. Expression, you know, you live by the sword and die by the sword. They live by the money and they die by the money. So if you come across Venice a little later and you realize, oh my gosh, look at all that they have. Look at the number of city-states that they've managed to acquire, knowing that they can buy, but it's about buying, buying, buying. You want to be able to cripple their trade. And if you are able to blockade their trade, plunder their trade roads, prevent them from doing that, then even though it might not be instantaneous, if you can then simultaneously yourself continue the onslaught, and of course, yes, I'm talking about wiping them from the map here, so this might be a domination-based thing, I don't know, at least in that respect, removing them from the equation Uh, is key. And if you really want to troll someone, even like a human player, and they want to play Venice or they happen to roll Venice, then I'll just say as one of these exceptional asides, if you disable (laughs) city-states, or you (laughs) outright, like that's complete noxious, but if you can prevent them from getting to city-states or prevent them from getting to more city-states, either because they physically can't get there, or you take them out yourself one way or another, then you can really hurt them. So they can be very powerful, but because of how powerful they are with gold, it's a very heavy investment on that side. And it's kind of the bigger they are with the money or the bigger any sieve with, is with any particular element of the game, the harder they can fall by that same measure. Oh yeah, Venice is easy to cut down to size. One embargo and then one ban trade with city-states. So two votes, 
just wipe out Venice. Oh, yeah, once you got the World Congress in place. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was mm-hmm. even before then or in lieu of that, but yeah, that too. Those two will just knock Venice down. I mean, yeah, they can still get the merchants of Venice, but they don't really have money after that. All those trade routes just dry up and disappear, which uh, obviously is a problem. Now, of course, if Venice goes freedom and decides to go for diplomacy, they are the ones that have the best usage of the uh, freedom diplomacy level three tenant, which uh, allows you to get influence with city-states if you have trade routes. Given that you have double the amount of trade routes, you can get double the amount of city-states rolling. But again, freedom can also get knocked out by a single uh, World Congress vote by just blocking trade to city-states. So they can do some pretty powerful stuff, but pretty easy to knock over. Yeah, and then if they're in that particular ideology, if you choose another ideology and you're able to get other civilizations to adopt that as well, you can also give uh, Venice a little happiness hit because their people might not be so content with having the ideology they have. And then they've got that added element to deal with as well. Mm -hmm. It takes a little more care and effort not to uh, get completely wiped out as Venice, (laughs) at least on higher difficulty levels. (laughs) If you have a great Gallius fleet at the right time, you can just take all coastal cities. They're pretty powerful at the time. Besides Venice being alphabetically the last civ we're going to profile on this episode, it transitions well to this general game mechanic that we've kind of been touching upon with most of these civilizations. It's new and improved, because it did technically exist before, but in a very limited fashion, you know, by connecting cities to each other. Trade routes. Yes. But then you have proper trade routes, which are even better, because you get money and you get science. Well, if you're trading to another proper civilization, not to city-state, you go to city-state, you just get gold. But they can also get science, too. So if you were ahead in the game and you were trying to trade to, like, a lesser civ, you might not want to trade them, because they're getting science off of you. I don't know. Yeah, and I think on the science portion, you will notice that if there is the possibility that you can get additional uh, beakers per turn from another civilization and or that they could get that from you, I mean, that's all presented to you in the interface before you commit that this is what you're going to get for the duration of that trade route, which on standard speed is, what, 30 turns, I think? Yeah, because I think it's 20 on quick. And you're locked in. Unless the trade route gets plundered, then it's going to run its course. Also, not just important about the science, but also you can spread your religious influence that way. But you can get other religious influence coming to you the same way, just like the science goes back and forth. And similar to how uh, the game determines you know, who's ahead technologically, if you're going to get science, there will be an indication that so-and-so has X number of technologies more than you. Yeah, it's not more. It's different. Exactly. Slight adjustment to the wording there, just because you could have two people with 10 texts, but if you both have 10 different texts from each other, then you're both getting a lot of science from each other. Yeah, so don't feel like, oh, there's no point in trying to trade with this person because we're in the same era. Not necessarily. No, no. You could have gone up the upper path going towards cultural things. They could have gone the lower path towards war or vice versa. Vice versa is better because then you can take all their stuff and then get everything. (laughs) And as for the gold portion, still talking about external trade routes here, the greater distance between the cities and the existence of markets or any other trade-related buildings in your city will also increase the gold. And for some reason, if your land trade routes are able to make use of roads, they will extend farther. It's not odd. (laughs) Don't forget the tourism bonus for trade routes as well. Mm -hmm. Tourism, religion, science, all piggybacking on uh, this gold-based trade route. Or internal. Yeah, so what about them, their internal trade roads, Mackie? You remember how in Civ 1 and Civ 2 you could pile up a bunch of caravans and send them all to your city to build a wonder? Well, you can kind of do this, <laughs> except you can have all of your city send food or production to another city. Like, you could send it all to your capital, and your capital can grow super big. It's not instantaneous. It's a steady stream, though, over many turns, so it will still accelerate what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Whether you're trying to grow something really big or you're just trying to get your production really high because you're trying to crank out things. And it is true that these internal trade routes do not benefit the originating city, but that sometimes you don't care about that. And also they don't take out extra food from the city. It magically appears out of thin air. Magically delicious. (laughs) Yes. Magic hammers and magic food. 
And they also help if you find yourself isolated. Uh, <laughs> or, or so somebody puts the embargo city states through. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Flat out embargo. Well, I'll just throw all this production into my capital and build an army to unembargo myself. Now, if you're in a one city challenge situation by choice or circumstance, well, yeah, mm, okay, might be a problem for internal trade. Work. But uh, there are exceptions to everything. We'll just acknowledge that up front. And of course, let's just make sure that we uh, clarify that uh, there's a difference between sea based trade routes and land based trade routes. Oh, that's the other biggie. Yes. Sea based trade. Nice. Yeah, sea based gives you twice as much of, well, everything. But in theory, are also much riskier to have. If you have enough of a fleet, it's not so bad. If you get yourself in the middle of a war, or if there's barbs wandering around. Or those pesky city-states with their stupid caravels that fly all over the map, picking off trade routes. And the sea-based routes also have greater range as well. Yeah, greater range, right off the mark, etc., etc. Although that greater range is not direct line greater range. Uh, so you don't just count the tiles from one to another and, oh, that's only five tiles across. Yeah, except you have to go all the way up this peninsula <laughs> and then come all the way back down. Yeah. <laughs> Knowing that you can get your first trade route at animal husbandry, uh, and then also in the ancient era, there's also one available at sailing. I often find that if I don't meet a quote-unquote civilization proper, I will meet a city-state, or I will often find that a city-state is closer to me. Now, you may say, well, if you find the city-state that's closer to you and you realize, oh, you know, you could get plus two gold per turn from that, and then a few turns later, you find a civilization proper. Well, assuming that your land-based or your sea-based trade route can actually reach that other civilization, which is part of the factor, because if not, then you might want to forward settle on that person. You might say, well, but I've gone ahead and I've committed this trade route for, you know, the 30 turns on standard speed or the 20 turns on quick speed, whatever it happens to be. And in the end, I start doing the math. And if I realize if I just waited a few turns, then I could have made this more lucrative trade. So, Early exploration, I think, is, well, besides, you know, ruins, even if you turn ruins off, knowing where people are. So you have a lay of the land. So you get a better idea of, okay, I have a coastal city or I don't have a coastal city. So that determines whether or not you're going to be going for sailing, uh, specifically for being able to do sailing as a first option as compared to, say, animal husbandry. Or you decide you're going to do cargo versus land. Are you going to be able to defend those trade routes? I think you can second guess yourself, but if you explore early, then I think you're going to lessen that likelihood of if I'd just been patient and waited, I would have been farther ahead. And you need to think about that because you can't say, hey, you know this trader I established five turns ago? Yeah, I'm going to cancel that. I'm going to go with this other one. You can certainly establish another trade route if you still have another one to establish, but you have to wait for it to end Yeah, before you can reassign it. That's fine. If you choose to reassign it. The one thing to really put into people's minds, though, for those early trade routes, if you don't have a worker and you have a choice between, you know, eight turns to build a worker and eight turns to build the trade route, build the worker. Um, it's worth more because you can get that early trade route after eight turns and get, you know, one to two gold per turn from some other civ or city state. But since neither of you have actually improved your tiles, uh, i.e. resources and luxuries and all that then you're always going to get crappy output. Whereas if you get that worker first, you can improve your tiles and therefore get actual money out of the uh, trade route. Plus, if, if you take the worker and improve your tiles, you get the standard benefit of having a better city. But you also look a lot more attractive for trade routes to AIs and other civs. So they may, in the time that it takes you to get everything approved, they may send you a number of trade routes before you're able to even produce one yourself. While you don't get as much money for being the receiver, you definitely get the science. And even a little bit of money out of the uh, trade routes is better than uh, none. <laughs> the AI is not dumb enough to send you a bunch of trade routes and then declare war on you. And so people may think that this is part of the reason why AIs t tend not to uh, declare war on you by the turn 30 anymore, their, their neighbor. <laughs> Basically, the AI will take take a look at how much money they're getting from the trade routes to you versus how much they'd lose if they declared war on you. And if that's going to put them negative gold per turn, then uh, that's going to hurt them. And therefore, it's better that they uh, choose to wait to send it somewhere else. So uh, AI is not as dumb as it seems. <laughs> <laughs> In some regards. 
Uh, yeah. Wait, it's smart about a thing? Oh no, is this learning? <laughs> Other trade routes, you also get another one at engineering and compass, which also extends your sheet uh, rent range. Banking, industrial, modern, uh, as well as at uh, penicillin. So other than the ancient era, it's essentially you're getting another one per era. And also at modern, combustion will extend the land range route and refrigeration will again extend the uh, sea route range. Yep. It also makes it important to get a harbor in if you're doing a lot of sea routes because that also gives you extra range. Mm-hmm. So if you want trade routes around the world, focus. Yes. And so if you're thinking to yourself, you know, there's that achievement, and I have this achievement, if you're getting 200 gold per turn from all of your trade routes, uh, may I suggest sea-based trade routes? May we also suggest <laughs> Venice? I managed to get it without Venice. I don't need Venice to get these fancy things. Ooh, I'm just that He's hard. jelly. He's jelly, guys. <laughs> jelly. Dan's jelly. I'm jelly of your overpowered traits. <laughs> You're not cutting my route, son. Oh, yeah. And trade routes can be pillaged for money. Mm, <laughs> trade route pillaging. Act of war. I was about to say that. Also, you need to. You can't just. <laughs> yeah, you can't just up and pillage and say, oh, that was yeah. barbs. That was totally barbs, man. <laughs> so totally the years. barbs. <laughs> I, I don't know how that pirate ship got there. I, yeah. Nope. New wonders of Brave New Worlds. Orpter. Comes with theology, plus five faith. Three missionaries appear, and uh, you have to build it in the holy city. So that's one world wonder. Uh, another one is Broadway, plus two culture. One free great magician. Magician, yeah, one free great musician <laughs> appears near the city where the world wonder is built. <laughs> great magician. <laughs> <laughs> Like, yes, okay, you get a great person for building the wonder, but that's not free. You invested hammers to build the wonder. Ugh, come on now. They made this mistake in their Civ 4 wonder descriptions, and apparently they're carrying it right over to Civ 5. Anyway, in addition, you also get three slots for great works of music. Globe Theater comes with printing press. One free great writer appears next to the city where the wonder was built. Contains two slots for great works of writing. <sighs> Unfortunately, it does not allow you to completely and utterly abuse the happiness mechanic any longer. That will be missed. Draft, 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 draft. <laughs> and by the way, draft. <laughs> Parthenon. All right. So you need drama and poetry, apparently. Uh, requires architecture and uh, aesthetics. And it gives culture plus five, three great works of art or artifacts slots. And uh, one quote-unquote free great artist appears near the city where you build it. You have the Prora. Am I pronouncing that correctly? It looks like it's Prora to me. You need Octocracy for that. In addition to plus two happiness, the Prora Resort provides plus one more happiness for every two policies you have adopted. One free social policy, quote-unquote. Must be constructed the old, in the uh, coastal city. The old uh, Eiffel Tower. Yeah. Now, that is one free social policy. That word free there, that is accurate. No, you, you actually still have a cost for that, Dan. And that would be the cost associated with building the wonder in the first place. You build the wonder, you get the effects. There's a cost. Yeah, I know there's the cost, but it's, it's talking about if you're already going to be getting like a social policy in a couple of turns, it's not like, oh, now i got to wait for the next up. Well, a better way to describe that would be uh, one extra social policy that's not adding to your cost, though, uh, for an additional... Oh my gosh, so long didn't listen. I mean, no, no just free works. <laughs> TLDL. <laughs> All right, next wonder is the Red Fort. You need metallurgy for it. Um, defensive buildings in all cities are 25% more effective. Old Kremlin. <laughs> mm. There was also a change to an existing wonder. A few of them, actually. Uh, so I thought there was just a change to Terracotta Army. Oh, there's that, yeah. That's there's... an important change. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, creates a copy of each type of military unit you control and places the unit near the city where the Terracotta Army is constructed, as opposed to, what was it before, plus five culture? Mm -hmm. Oh, a small change. Oh. It also retains plus one culture. Yeah, Eiffel Tower now gives you a flat tourism and flat happiness bonus rather than what the Prora now ha now has for uh, social policy-based happiness. Eiffel Tower no longer gives you super happiness. That's a shame. We should have two Eiffel Towers or old defect Eiffel Towers. I think we should also stack things at yeah. the Red Fort and be a really fun sieve to attack. Mm -hmm. Have an AI with Great Wall, the Red Fort, some tradition stuff, you know, some nice religious bonuses. 
Dan's favorite. Oh, and the Colossus and the Petra were both changed, obviously. Petra now gives you a free caravan, plus an extra trade route, and the Colossus gives you a free sea trade route. Uh, so each of those got adjusted to be more trade-related. Continuing on with this Wonders list, uh, International Space Station, which is a little bit different from other Wonders. It's not built like normal Wonders, but is instead awarded to first place contributor in the project for the International Space Station. And uh, mm-hmm. you get some stuff if you wind up getting the Wonder, and it just builds it in your capital. So you get plus one production from scientists, plus one science from engineers, and great scientists provide 33% more science when used to discover a tech. Mm-hmm. Oh, and if you have a crew on board, you'll receive a free great scientist. Get a research boost for contributed parts. That Now, there's a TLDR wonder description, but essentially you probably want to get the bonus if you're bothering to contribute significantly to the space station. Well, yeah. Question, yeah. do you like science? <laughs> <laughs> then again, it also shows up at a point in the tech tree where if you're going for a tech victory, you may not want to build it because if uh, there are other civs that can out-hammer you, to number one, then what you just did was give them a ah, leg up on you. <laughs> I see. If they uh, can uh, contribute to it in time. I guess it does depend on tech position. It's not well, another it's, space elevator, is it? Eh, kind of. It's a World Congress vote. So, one, you have, somebody has to get to the tech, and then two, somebody has to propose it as a world uh, project. Well, let and me then, rephrase this. Have you found any uh, instances where it actually improves your technology win time? Yeah. Mm, it worked for Venice, but it wasn't going for tech. <laughs> well, okay. If it has any use at all, then it's better than the space elevator and SIF 4, but the, <laughs> the way no, you're it, describing it reminds me of. <laughs> it, it has a use if, say, you're going for more academies and a little less great scientist bulb at the end of the game. And if you beeline to it, and get the project up before you use all your great scientists to bulb to get the final text. Oh. Uh, so if you're in a position to mass hammer it and win, then beelining to it so that you can get the boosted beaker generation from bulbing great scientists is useful if you have a few less than you normally would just Come to get, for get rid Why of do you have to make all the cool space wonders so convoluted in their use or useless outright? It's at the end of the tech tree, so it is powerful. So make it really strong. Make it ridiculously strong because it's at well, the it end is. of the tech tree. It is ridiculously strong. Unfortunately, you have to actually fight to get it. Yeah, that's lame. That's not lame. That's actually pretty good. Win right. with your tech victory. Win. Tech gives more tech. Winning. Pound winning. Sorry. You have to, you have, to have the hashtag. <laughs> National Visitor Center. This is a national wonder, and this one makes sense compared to the next one. Uh, 100% of culture from world wonders, natural wonders, and improvements is added to the tourism output of the city. Tourism output from Great Works plus 100%. Must have built a hotel in all cities. And uh, like most national wonders, it costs more if you have more cities and more hotels when you start building it. And no, we will not rail on the name chosen because we talked about that in a previous episode. <sighs> yes, yes. The other national wonder is the East India Company, even if you're playing on a flat map. Yep. Anyway, plus two happiness, plus four gold yield. Must have built a market in all cities. Trade routes other players make to the city with East India Company will generate an additional four gold for the city owner, and the trade route owner gains an additional two gold for the trade routes. Mm-hmm. Basically, build it, TP everything, get lots of gold per turn going in your city, and then everybody will send you more money. And then finally, the new natural wonders. King Solomon's Mines, plus six production. Lake Victoria, plus six food. Go Canada! (laughs) (laughs) Whatever. Kilimanjaro, plus three food, plus two culture. Adjacent units move at double speed through hills and receive a combat bonus on hills for the rest of the game. That's uh, interesting. Pretty good. High altitude training. Yeah, that lasts forever. Yeah. <laughs> that well, worked for me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you get it on a scout early, um, you really can scout the map very, very quickly. Yeah. Especially a Shoshone scout. But uh, if you happen to have that wonder in or near your cities, filing all of your units through it before sending them to the front line is not necessarily a bad thing. Why would you not do that? Well, speed of delivery sometimes. Well, yeah, but if it's close. Yeah, as long as it's close enough. Speaking 
speaking of sounding good, uh, some people commented on some recent episodes of the show. Uh, we're going to talk about the latest episode, plus one from a month ago. First was in response to episode 178, comments over on Sif Fanatics, where we had some special guests. Uh, we had Dennis Shirk and Ed Beach from Fraxis Games, the lead designer and producer, respectively, on Civilization V Brave New World. King Chris 20 said, just got a chance to listen. Absolutely awesome. Lots of answers. Uh, and as for uh, the visceral that was, and actually I think about like a third or 40% of the discussion was about, I can't believe they didn't include this civilization, but they acknowledged that they were considering it. My favorite was actually the first one, Talco. You considered Canada, but picked Brazil. Oh, Lord, bring on the contempt. <laughs> yeah, there was, there was no contempt. <laughs> no, absolutely not. None whatsoever. On changing existing civilizations, uh, B. Kaiko had said, I was a little surprised to hear about Japan being high on the list of civs being considered for an overhaul, especially given the gripes these forums have about India, though that seems to have been relieved a bit by the change in game mechanics. It's true that Japan's unique ability is completely passive, and Ed Beach seems determined to make the game more active. Also, Japan's unique ability has been nerfed quite a bit since Vanilla. Still, I've never considered Japan in dire need for a change. Yeah, except for the whole zero thing doesn't work. <laughs> Eric24, that's A-R-I-K-24, said, About the let's fix Germany and Japan, do they really need to be fixed at all? Germany has overlap with the Zulu. Yes, that is true, but as has been pointed out, Germany's unique ability works for all eras, while the Zulu unique ability only works for melee units, which runs out at the Renaissance. The Renaissance? As for Japan, just scale the unique ability for Brave New World, and you're set. Although I will admit they could add a thing about Japanese culture that would make it a little better. Special giant death robots. There you go. Yep. They give you culture kills. <laughs> <laughs> that would be extra useful. <laughs> Aztecs might have something to say about that. Anyway. Well, I mean, if Japan scrapes them off of the uh, bottom side of the foot of the Godzilla robot that they build, then they can have a discussion about it. Star STX had said it was a great episode. Interesting to hear from Dennis Shirk and Ed Beach. Talk about AI considerations for war, which seem to be among the top current topics on the forum. It may have some reason why it actually came up as a topic of conversation. I thought it was interesting that they admitted that in Gods and Kings, the previous Civilization V expansion pack, that the AI was declaring war more often than what they intended and that they needed additional checks conversation ended there since it answered the question if the AI was made more passive, but a follow-up could have been addressed with the new additions or additions to what was checked if they needed rebalancing. I personally like the new changes, but again, it was interesting to hear how they felt they ramped up the AI declaration of war too much in Gods and Kings. And, and I personally didn't like the early declarations of war that I could just expect as an automatic at any opportunity from the AI. But one has to wonder if this is a feature that will ever satisfy the people that play. Some will always feel the AI does not declare war enough, while others will always feel they declare war too much, often to their own detriment. I would have liked to know if they feel this feature is working roughly as intended to their expectations now in Brave New World, although it may be too early to tell. And I think that that is very much a personal perspective and also what victory condition you're going for or think uh, that you're going for. Although I will say that the additional checks and balances for the AI has definitely helped it seem a little less schizophrenic. Uh, They still backstab, but there seems to be a bit more rational basis or at least less irrational basis for some of their actions because uh it, it is to their own detriment in the short or the long term it often seemed mm. and seek acknowledge that polycast is his favorite podcast thank you seek that was very kind as for episode 175, though, Nunor had initially said, not a single mention of the Venice Shoshone leak. I am disappointed. And I pointed out that you, Phil, actually did allude vaguely to the rumor while we were segueing into the uh, topic of conversation of New Brave New World information. But we didn't really go into it in any more detail because it hadn't been confirmed. It was, in fact, simply a rumor. So until such a point that it was confirmed, then it was at best a suspected leak. So why contribute to that conversation. But the real extensive part of episode 175, and I am not going to read all of my responses, uh, but I think one of the issues that came up was in recent episodes, there didn't seem to be a lot of strategy discussion. And I talked about that at the beginning of the show already. 
Although someone did say, Amit Show had said that compared to other podcasts I listened to, there seems somewhat lacking in structure. There's no, we're going to talk about this today, and there's many breaks, and the talk itself doesn't feel as fluid. A little bit of speed could be useful, maybe. There was a time where you would listen to the episode and you would hear a summary that, you know, in the news, we are going to talk about such and such. And then in this segment, we're going to talk about such and such. We would say that at the end of the episode recording, once we knew what topics we actually got to. And we cut that out a few years ago. There were some people at the time asked you know, people for their input about what they thought about it. No one really said anything. I think we as a regular panel enjoyed that in part because, well, it gave some more time in the episode to talk about what it was that we were going to talk about. And the show notes, which are on the Polycast website and in our RSS feed, outline what the topic that we are going to discuss. I don't feel particularly strongly about returning to it, and I kind of pointed out kind of the first person that said that. So I guess if you feel like-minded audience and you would like to see a return to that, then let us know and uh, we will revisit it. I will say just kind of an overall comment because someone had said, I hope you don't think being too harsh and everyone who had a criticism, it was constructive. So I responded to it. If you look through some episode conversations uh, on CFC and other Civ forums as well, if you're just commenting to criticize and to try to, you know, troll, get into a bit of a flame war, I'm not going to even start with that because it's not worth my time. And quite frankly, it's not worth any more time of yours either. Although... Seriously, don't give Dan suggestions like, hey, let's have a poll every six months, because he will. He'll love it. (laughs) He he loves a good poll, and he'll poll all the time if he can. And then we'll talk about the poll on every episode, because it's a poll, and it always goes to the top of Dan's list. As for the fluidity of the conversation... That's why there are the breaks, yeah. by the way, in between the topics within a segment or between the segments, because some of often the topics aren't directly related. I mean, they're related because it's about Civilization Five, It's about Civ Four, It's about civilization in general. And they use that to actually, in a way, kind of generate a flow between the two, because most episodes, a lot of what we're talking about is what's being discussed in the forums. And we want to bring that to people's attention because we want to reflect that that is what it is that people are talking about as opposed to our necessarily introducing topics and saying, you know, Civ community, you really should be talking about this. But we want to bring attention to what the community is talking about, what people are saying, and then putting our own spin on it as well. So I guess I'll just say that, you know, we try to connect it together as much as possible. Uh, I try to have it so that we don't have one topic for like six or seven different segments in an episode because we have had in the past that people enjoyed segments that went a little longer, a little bit more depth of topics as opposed to breadth. And so I think we are generally doing that, uh, have been doing that for some time. But certainly, as hopes will be evidenced during this episode, as well as the next two episodes, they are going to be a strategy heavy because we want to reflect that hey we've got a new expansion out people are playing it and the civilization 5 experience is changing just just a little bit just a little bit this is a video podcast you you just see my fingers showing just how little it's changed on episode 180 we're going to be talking about assyria brazil poland updated culture system updated diplomacy and changes to the technology tree poland can into space Call Call in in today. today. In North America, the number is 301-637-7659. That's 301-637-POLY. In Europe, 44-121-288-7659. That's 44-121-288-POLY. The only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. For more information on Polycast, our sibling shows Modcast, Revcast, and Turncast, or about Polycast in general, log on to the series' official website at thepolycast.net. Thank you for listening to episode 179 of Polycast. I'm Dan Q, and this is surely the best possible closing line to an episode of Polycast ever, joined by Makalua. I need to go caffeine more now. The me and team. My merchants of Venice bribe cardinals and elect me Pope. Imagine. Yeah, I think we're done today. And thanks to all who listened. Keep on sivin'.
Hey, I told you before we started, either Shoni or Venice, because I haven't played Portugal, so I don't know crap about Portugal. I was given Portugal. You were given Morocco. Yeah. <laughs> the name starts with M. Yes. <laughs> well, my other name starts with S. That well. doesn't count right now. But you used to, he used that to pick the Portugal for you. Why does it not count? Because everyone knows my first name. I, I open that freely. I mean, my forum avatar has my first name on it, after all. Before saying fact at the end of every sentence becomes really obnoxious, speaking of some obnoxious resource diversity grants... That, what? <laughs> that's that's kind of like, I just... I just <coughs> the segue is like a bridge to nowhere. Like, the bridge is there, but it's not really... Anyway. Next. <laughs> I just drove off the edge of a thousand footer into the ocean. Okay. <laughs> I think that was an attempt to segue into Portugal, so I'm just going to roll with it. Unique ability... Why did you give me stuff that I, I will botch the pronunciation for, man? <laughs> He's already said Victoria before. That's not a unique Victoria. ability. That's a unique improvement. <laughs> no, 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 no. Say Victoria. Say it. Victoria. Fail Toria. Fail Toria. <laughs> Fail Toria is Fail Toria. Except for that it probably won't be in this iteration. Since you brought it up, I'll say the unique improvement first. Well, fall under the heading of exceptional civilization. Yes. So now I can talk about. <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> if you have to ask, the answer is no. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now that I'm allowed to talk about the Shoshone, <laughs> <laughs> they got shot down earlier. Er. <laughs> what are the sequence? You didn't read from your script. There are penalties for that, Packy. Mm-hmm. You lose five interweb what? dollars. <laughs> So, approximately zero dollars? <laughs> yes. Yes, you must stick to the script. Mackie, will you please introduce the next civilization? There we go. I read oh, from my Man, show. if we did it in an entire episode like that, we'd probably lose, like, four-fifths uh. of our listener base. Like, using the, um, the automated speech stuff for the entire episode. I apologize to the listeners for even bringing that up, actually. Maybe we should just continue with the Shoshone. So, I think that episode that you described there, Phil, where we talk like that, come right after the musical episode. <laughs> oh, sometime after the zombie apocalypse, gotcha. You want to lose all of the listeners, not just most of them, huh? Okay. <laughs> it's delicious. Mm, speaking about delicious. <laughs> How much fun is Venice? Eh, hey, Venice sucks. Moving on. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so what about them, their internal trade routes, Mackie? Their trade routes, their internal, their... It's basically <laughs> what you had earlier. It's They've just been renamed, and they're, you know... <laughs> no, there's the real internal uh, trade routes. Uh, Please define a chair while it's a chair. <laughs> the trade routes. You get cash off of it. This, no, no. this is a no-brainer thing that you connect your road, cities with. I think we were going with the internal trade routes, like you can move food and... Yeah. Uh, oh, that part of it. I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought you meant the normal city connection thing. And... Banking, industrial, and... Engineering. In the modern... You missed engineering. No, he said engineering. I did. I said engineering. I did. Yes, I did. I did. Listen better. Yes. Yeah, oh, you. <laughs> Imagine just feels again like he hasn't said enough this episode already. He should. <laughs> Modern. <laughs> the next topic. Uh, are we going to get illiterate now? I like how that seg is into Phil's topic. <laughs> Phil. <laughs> F you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was going with the other meaning. <laughs> oh. Oh, but that acknowledges that that meaning is true, because now he's talking about the other meaning. <laughs> Every multiple meanings. Especially yeah. with me involved. So, everyone think about it? Hmm. Sure. Yeah, let's, let's, let's think. <laughs> Are you answering for all of us, Mitch? Hashtag winning. Ah, uh, this you meant before you had a chance to say that, Phil. I wanted the last word. F so you. <laughs> <laughs> Shock. Oh, the stream heard the start of what you said, because he can't say you got cut off there, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> yes, last half word. Recording July 27th, 2013.
Civilization 4 and 5 sound clips copyright Take Two Interactive. Copyright Civilized Communication at civcom.net.